Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HPL seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Anupriya Singh. In 2007, Anupriya started her undergraduate in biomedical engineering at the Uttar Pradesh Technical University in Lucknow, India. During her undergraduate, she primarily worked on a project which was about developing pulse reader using a surface EMG. After she achieved a Bachelor's of Technology degree in 2011, she decided to build her academic career more. So she started a master's course at the Central Scientific Instruments Organization in um, Chandigarh. Her research was specialized in instrumentation engineering, where she developed a wheelchair that could be controlled by electromyography or EMG. She further mentioned that developing this EMG controlled wheelchair has become one of scientific accomplishments that she is most proud of. In 2019, she came to Canada to start her PhD here at the University of Calgary under the supervision of Dr. Amir Sanati Nazad and Dr. Walter Herzog. Anipriya is currently interested in um, microfluidic platforms for disease detection and electrochemical sensing, which is related to the topic uh, of our presentation today. Aside from her academic career, I also asked about interesting facts about her about herself that um, were not related to the work. And she answers that she has, when she has lots of things to work on, she actually tends to leave her desk, not working for a while and try to cook and feed her friends and colleagues. So I guess um, I should be around Anipuria, especially when she seems to be busy so that I can get something to eat. Today, she'll be giving a talk about biosensor for detection of biomarkers uh, of the osteoarthritis. So Anipuria, you can start your share screen and whenever you're ready. Sure, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Anupriya and I'm supervised by Dr. Amar Sanati Nezad and Professor Walter Herzog. Um, topic for today's talk is uh, detection of biomarkers of osteoarthritis um, using uh, home fabricated biosensors. Um, so the agenda would be as such, uh, I'll be talking a bit about the uh, disease and the technique that I'll be using in order to characterize and calibrate the biosensor that I'll be developing, which in turn will lead to a development of a high selective uh, biosensor. Uh, talking about the disease, osteoarthritis or OA is, uh, is a long-term chronic disease, uh, which is characterized by uh, deterioration of the cartilage in the joints, uh, which results in the bones rubbing together uh, and creating stiffness, um, pain or impaired movement. So the disease most commonly affects the um, joints in the knees, hip, shoulder, hand, and feet, uh, but is relatively common in uh, hip and shoulder joint. Um, so while OA is related to aging, it is also associated with a variety of both uh, modifiable and uh, non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, for example, uh, obesity, uh, lack of exercise, uh, bone density, or injury, or trauma or in some cases, gender. Um, according to United Nations, um, by 2050, uh, people aged over 60 will account for more than 20% uh, of the population, and 15% of that population will be suffering from OA, which is a huge number. <laughs> yeah, so the current existing methods of detection are mostly um, uh, physical examination, X-ray, and MRI, in that uh, physical examination um, shows the symptoms of OA, which may be um, joint swelling or limited range of motion or tenderness if the joint is touched, or pain during the normal movement, or even uh, a grating sound that is made during the uh, joint movement. Um, whereas an X-ray can uh, show the uh, 
loss of joints, loss of joint space in the affected joint. Uh, in more advanced cases, uh, even, you know, it can show the bone spurs or the evidence of the uh, bone down ends of the uh, bones in the affected joints. Um, whereas an MRI is able to distinguish between OA and uh, um, other kinds of injuries. So however, all these uh, diagnostic tools have low selectivity and specificity, and they are, they are rather uh, reactive methods than uh, predictive. So I say this because they do not really measure the dynamic changes in the joints and are usually implemented uh, when OA is symptomatic, like with a, when a subject goes to a physician with a complaint of either inflammation or pain or um, anything like related to the uh, movement. So, um, so these imaging modalities, they, uh, they actually are able to um, uh, examine at, at a stage when OA is already progressed to an advanced stage. Um, so all these imaging modalities, they use a certain kind of uh, gradings or uh, scoring uh, cl classification systems out of which um, Kelgren's and Lorentz uh, grading scale is one of them, which grades the entire joints from uh, grade zero to grade four, uh, with grade uh, zero being the no case of OA and grade four being the severe case of OA. So uh, the KL classification is based on the um, uh, radiographic uh, evidences, um, subchondral sclerosis or joint space narrowing or even um, bone shape alteration. So while these imaging techniques um, such as radiography can detect the monitor uh, structural changes uh, to the joints, um, giving an indication of the uh, disease stage or the rate of OA progression and disease progression cannot be uh, evaluated. Um, so OA is often not diagnosed until late stages, uh, like after significant uh, destructive loss to the joint has already occurred. Um, and it has been shown by uh, researchers in the field that uh, molecular bio indicators uh, in exist long before the radiographic evidences indicate the uh, presence of OA. And uh, roundabout, it's estimated to be existing uh, before 20 years uh, when it can be detected by the radiographic joint space narrowing. So the goal of the uh, biomarker research uh, was to develop a test that are either, uh, rather predictive than reactive. Um, and it's also said by the, uh, by the research, it's been shown that biomarkers can be uh, used uh, to detect and diagnose early onset of osteoarthritis and uh, monitor the uh, disease progression. Um, Talking about the biomarkers, uh, so these are any um, biological molecules which are found in either blood, a serum, synovial fluid, or urine, or any other body fluids or uh, tissues um, that is a sign of a normal or abnormal process or of a disease or condition. Uh, so biomarkers in osteoarthritis are most likely to be structural molecules or fragments which are linked to either cartilage, uh, bone, or synovium. And uh, they may be uh, specific to either one type of joint or maybe common to all of them. Um, they normally may represent tissue uh, degradation or tissue synthesis, or may be measured in uh, synovial fluid or blood or urine. So uh, osteoarthritis biomarkers networks, uh, they came up with a classification scheme, uh, which they named as BIPED, BIPED. Uh, which actually provides a common framework uh, for communication in the field, uh, which uh, classifies the biomarkers as burden of disease, investigative, prognostic, efficacy of intervention, or diagnostic. Um, so for my initial proof of concept to develop a biosensor, what I have selected is uh, a one such biomarker, which is, which is a cartilage oligomeric uh, matrix protein. Uh, which is a large pentameric uh, uh, glycoprotein secreted by the chondrocytes and is generally associated uh, with the uh, cartilage degeneration uh, in case of osteoarthritis or rheumatoid. Um, th this is also classified as BPD, which means it can be used uh, to distinguish uh, between the patient, uh, between individuals uh, suffering from osteoarthritis and not suffering from osteoarthritis. And in patients who are already suffering uh, from osteoarthritis have existing condition, then how well or how is it progressing? And in people who are not uh, exposed to it yet, um, it can predict the onset of osteoarthritis in those people, in those subjects. 
Um, there has been a lot of research done in the field um, to actually compare uh, the two groups, that is the control group with the, uh, with the osteoarthritic pe uh, people. And what uh, the study showed is that there was a significantly high concentration found in the uh, people suffering from osteoarthritis as compared to the uh, control subjects. Um, and also uh, there has been a comparison showing uh, the uh, concentration of serum, uh, concentration of comp in serum as compared to the KL grade. And as we see here, um, in mild case, it's, it ranges from 25, uh, 35, 32 uh, to 2,542 nanogram per ml. So these all concentrations are in nanogram per ml. And we see a trend like, um, in mild, moderate, and severe, the concentration of the maximum, it goes on decreasing, which means um, uh, in human model, um, the concentration of comp is inversely proportional to the uh, uh, duration of the disease, which means uh, when, when it's at the onset, it's uh, likely to be higher in concentration as compared to when it's progressing, when it has progressed to in um, like later stage of the disease. Um, yeah. So what my team does is uh, in order to detect these biomarkers, we, de we develop biosensors, which, which are used to um, detect these type of biomarkers, not only related to osteoarthritis, but related to other uh, infectious diseases or disease as such. Um, so what are these biosensors? So biosensors are any analytical devices that convert a biological response into a quantifiable and processable signal. So the main uh, component of the biosensor is the bioreceptor. This can be either enzyme, antibody, or microorganism. And uh, the transducer, it could be either electrode, uh, semiconductor pH electrode, or piezoelectric device. So what happens is the working, and this transducer actually converts the uh, interaction between the uh, analyte and the bioreceptor into a uh, uh, processable signal. So the working principle of this biosensor is that, um, so this bioreceptor, it specifically and uh, selectively reacts with the uh, analyte in the sample solution. And this interaction then changes the uh, uh, physical, physiochemical properties of the surface of the transducer, which could be either change in the pH, heat, light, or mass. And this in turn, uh, this interaction is then converted to an electronic signal, which can be either current or voltage, which is then detected by uh, the detector, which could be in the form of analog or digital output. So let me give you an example of a glucose sensor. Um, so what happens in glucose sensor is our sample here is uh, blood. The analyte that we want to detect is the uh, blood glucose. And the test strip here is our um, biosensor which is here you see um, bioreceptor, which is coated with the bioreceptor. So when, when uh, the analyte from the sample solution comes in contact with the uh, bioreceptor, which is coated on the test strip, it changes some chemical properties of the uh, test strip, which in turn is given by, uh, shown as a number, uh, displayed as a number on the display device, which is th in this case here, this uh, is a detector. So all these biosensors, they come with uh, certain uh, basic characteristics. That is, uh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> they're supposed to be linear, uh, which means uh, with uh, increasing the concentration of the analyte here, we should have the same trend of increase in the number displayed here. It should change linearly with the uh, uh, change in the concentration of the analyte. Sensitivity means um, when even a small change in the concentration of analyte would should be able to give a considerable uh, change in the output that we read. Um, selectivity, uh, which is imparted by this uh, property of bioreceptor that we use, because as we know, uh, antibody is really specific to the type of antigen we use. And the response time. For the response time, the faster the response time, the better the biosensor is. Uh, so uh, the advantage of the biosensors are like, they're really highly specific as I talked about the antibodies. Uh, and once the biosensor is fabricated, it is highly unlikely that these will be affected by the factors like uh, stirring or pH. Uh, they're really easy to use with uh, using just a small volume of the sample. Like throughout my experiments, I have been using only 25 microliter of the sample, which is uh, so less. And uh, they're rapid, accurate, and stable over a certain period of time. Um, so based on the uh, 
based on the type of uh, transducer used and the biorecognition element used, transducer and the biorecognition uh, element used, we have uh, two broad categories of the biosensors. Uh, one would be uh, uh, like has subcategories of mass-based biosensor, electrochemical or optical. Uh, these again depend on the uh, output of, of the biosensors. Like in optical biosensor, we have the output as in terms of light. In electrochemical, it can be either in terms of uh, current or voltage. Uh, in mass-based, it can be either magnetoelectric or piezoelectric. Uh, so for biorecognition element, like uh, it could be either antibody based or the phages or enzymatic or biomimetic. What I'm using for my experimental setup is a combination of electrochemical uh, biosensor and uh, with the biorecognition element as antibody. So, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry. So these uh, electrochemical biosensors, uh, they transform the um, biochemical information such as an light concentration into useful signals, which can be either current or voltage. So these are normally based on enzymatic uh, catalysis of a reaction. Uh, what happens is the sensor substrate usually contains a uh, three electrode system, which I'll be explaining later. Uh, so what happens is uh, the target and light is involved in the reaction, uh, which, is, uh, which takes place as the active electrode. And the reaction may either cause electron transfer or uh, across the double layer or contribute to the double layer formation uh, across the uh, layer potential. So we can either measure the current or we can either measure the uh, uh, voltage. Okay, so. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. So uh, this is a typical electrode, which we modify and make it into uh, a biosensor. So this we call as three electrode system, which is uh, why, because we have a gold working electrode. This is a central area. Uh, this is what I'll be referring to as active uh, electrode, silver reference, uh, silver as reference electrode and platinum as counter electrode. So <clears throat> the technique or uh, the technique like overall, uh, the technique that I use is I take the electrode. Uh, this is the touch pad with, I connect it to the connector. Uh, attached to a reader. So potential stat here is a detector and then attached to a monitor or display device. So what I do is I apply a certain amount of voltage uh, to this. In turn, what I measure is the output current. So I have a plot which gives uh, a voltage on the X axis and uh, current on the Y axis. This technique uh, we refer as empirometric technique. Mm. Okay, yeah. So uh, what, uh, sorry. <laughs> So if I want to uh, use a biorecognition element as antibody to de detect uh, the analyte here in our case, it's comp. So what I'd be doing is I would just uh, drop cast the antibody on the surface here, let it sit for a while and then uh, expose it to the antigen, like the comp here, and then measure the signal in the same way, like uh, attached to the uh, uh, detector and then take the reading, apply the voltage and take the current output current. But in that situation, the reading all the time we get every time we have, it's not reproducible. It means like every time uh, the antibodies are not uh, uh, are not particularly oriented in the same manner. It means it are these are randomly oriented, which means it's going to reduce the sensitivity and reproducibility of the biosensor. So in that case, what we do is we modified the surface in order to create a linker that allows the binding of the antibodies in a uh, in an oriented manner, so that it uh, it gives a, a biosensor, it generates a biosensor which is uh, really reproducible and sensitive to the um, the comp or the target that we're using here. So what I do is I take um, the bare electrode, the blank electrode. When I say bare, it means I have nothing on it, and it's just a simple electrode. So what I do is I modify the surface uh, by using some organic or non inorganic uh, or inorganic materials. Uh, so that to create linkers, which in turn would um, provide the attachment for the antibodies. Once the antibodies are bound, we will expose it to the uh, comp and let it sit for a while, then wash it and then take the reading. So if I don't have the uh, comp attached now, like this has been only to the antibody, what we have, we apply the voltage and we observe for the current. We observe a peak here. Um, and when we expose it to the uh, comp antigen and then let it sit for a while and then take the read, wash it and then apply the voltage and take the current, what we see is we see a decrease in the peak. 
which is attribute uh, which is attributed to the uh, reason like you know because uh, with addition of each of these layers the impedance of the surface here it increases which means there is decrease in the current so this is what we are going to measure once i have this uh, um, surface modification done i want to characterize whether uh, the deposition of each of these layers was successful um, and if i could get a biosensor that i intended to develop so what I do is I uh, get a characterization curve. In that, I take uh, the same, I apply the same technique of taking readings at each and every step, like at the blank, after modification, after antibody mobilization, and after uh, it, uh, it is exposed to, or it comes in contact with the antigen or the comp. So what I observe here is, so this plot here shows um, the uh, potential applied on the x-axis and output current on the y-axis. The technique that I'm using is amperometric technique um, and I have used throughout like 25 microliters of the sample and n is equal to three means like I have used for each and every uh, reading I use three electrodes. So once I when I took the blank electrode I had the current peak of around uh, 95 to 96 microampere. Uh, which is on the bare liquid, it has nothing on the surface. So this would act uh, as our base for uh, uh, next uh, few surfaces that we are going to deposit on the uh, electrode. Um, after the modification, like the first modification, what we see is there's a decrease in the peak, um, which means that by the addition of these um, organic or inorganic substances, what we, uh, what we do is we increase the impedance on the surface. That is, uh, this, the resistance to the flow of electrons increases, which in turn decreases the current. Um, next, what happens is once we know, I, and also this confirms that the deposition of that layer was successful. So now we move on to the next step. That is, we have already created a linker that could uh, provide an attachment to the uh, antibody. That is our next step. After this, what I do is I take uh, 25 microgram per ml concentration of the antibody, um, anti-comp antibody, and I drop cast it on the surface of the electrode. I let it sit for a while, I wash it, and then I take the same reading. I apply the voltage and I uh, uh, read uh, the current output. So what I observe again is like uh, we have decrease in the peak, which again um, is because of the increase in impedance that uh, reduces the current. Uh, and also it infers that um, we have the successful immobilization of the antibody on the surface of the electrodes. Now this is uh, very selective. This is supposed to be very selective because we have used uh, anti-comp antibody. So now we have the antibody uh, deposited on the surface. What we could do next is uh, we could just uh, put our uh, comp, uh, drop cast the uh, comp on the surface and then let it sit for a while so that uh, antibody and the antigen interacts and then wash it and take the reading. But in that case, we, we would again not get, uh, get a repeatable re result. The reason being the entire surface of the electrode is not covered by the antibodies. It means we have some leftover spaces which are blank. So the uh, comm could go and sit in those uh, places and then give a false in decrease, in, uh, decrease in the current. And in order to avoid that, what we do is we, uh, we uh, use a blocking agent uh, in order to block those non-binding sites. Uh, for that as well, in order to have that successful uh, deposition of that layer, we should uh, observe a decrease in the current peak. And this is what we observe, that is uh, the current peak decreases uh, uh, as compared to the antibody. After this, what we want to do is now we have, uh, uh, we are successful in doing all these steps. Now we want to uh, see the interaction between the antibody and the antigen. What we want to do is, we uh, uh, we have certain concentration of the comp. Uh, I have here used 10 nanogram per ml, and I uh, drop cast on the surface of the electrode. Let it sit for a while, like 30 minutes, and then wash it, and then take the reading. Um, so the peak further decreases, which means there was an interaction between the antibody and the antigen of 10 nanogram per ml. That's why we have the uh, decrease in the current peak. In order to further confirm, like, what if uh, I increase the concentration of the comp antigen? Uh, what what happens if I decrease the concentration of the antigen? What happens? So I have one case here added uh, for the concentration of the comp to be 75 nanogram per ml, and we see that it decreases furthermore. So which means, like, by addition of each and every concentration, increasing con concentration, it should decrease. And but of course, it will have a saturation point, which means uh, how much uh, concentration it can go up to in that detection range. 
So once I have this uh, electrode, like the biosensor characterized, uh, I wanted to see um, how well the biosensor, uh, you know, um, how well it is able to differentiate between one concentration to the other concentration, and how well does it um, work in the lower concentration range. Um, for this calibration curve, what I did was I kept all the uh, steps until the blocking agent to be constant and uh, uh, just changed the concentration of the comp. Uh, and the way I did was I uh, had the serial dilution uh, from 100 nanogram per ml down to one nanogram per ml. Uh, the technique that I'm using in this again is uh, amperometric where I apply the voltage and I get the output current. So um, what I observe is, uh, so yeah, I have a plot now which shows a concentration of the comp on the X axis and on Y axis we have I naught minus I in microampere. So um, I naught here stands for the current that is corresponding to the blocking agent uh, used. And I here stands for the uh, current which is corresponding to the all the uh, concentrations from 100 nanogram per ml to one nanogram per ml. So we take the difference on the Y axis. So what we see is even the smaller range from one nanogram per ml to 100 nanogram per ml, like uh, it's quite a bit linear. And one important thing to note in this graph is the error bars were so small they, that they are contained within the uh, red dots. Yeah. And so um, once I had the you know, calibration and characterization done, um, so these biosensors, they are specifically, they, they, they should be selective. Which means, um, which means if I make, if I'm fabricating the biosensor to be uh, detecting the biomarkers like COM, it should only detect COM. It should not be able to bind to other anti, uh, other biomarkers. So what I did for this test was I, in my sample solution, I had this UCHL and NFL. These two are the biomarkers of the brain injury and bovine serum albumin. So I spiked all these and then I took the reading. Again, here, I naught is the um, uh, current peak corresponding to the uh, blocking agent, and I is uh, the current uh, corresponding to the different uh, to the 10 nanogram concentration of these biomarkers. And what I saw was the uh, the more the difference, which means uh, the uh, better the interaction between the antibody and the uh, comp. So, which means here we have uh, the biosensors which is which selectively react to the comp rather than the other biomarkers in the sample. So meanwhile, like I was working um, on technical side uh, of the project, but meanwhile, what uh, I was doing with, uh, in collaboration with Professor Herzog's group was we were doing a high fat and high sucrose diet where we had two groups. Uh, one was fed with chow and the other was high fat and high sucrose diet. And um, what we wanted to do with this was once I had my uh, biosensor developed, uh, we also collected the blood uh, at a, at three weeks, six weeks, uh, nine and 12 weeks. What we want to see is uh, the trend of the comp uh, concentration at these time frames. And uh, once we have uh, better results or once we have these results, at some point we want to uh, be able to compare these results from the biosensors with the histological uh, changes in the joints observed. So, um, yeah, so in um, summary, I could say now, for now, I have the biosensor, which is highly selective with the comp, um, uh, and it is able to perform linearly even in the lower concentration, and it's quite quick, as in it just uh, gives a result in 25 to 30 minutes uh, after fabrication. And uh, uh, thank you to uh, Professor Herzog, Dr. Amir, and Nada. Uh, for helping me out in the unknown domain. And uh, yeah, I can take up any questions. Thank you, Anipriya. So now if you could stop sharing the screen so we could see each other um, better, it would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to kindly encourage everyone to turn on the camera during the discussion period if you um, feel comfortable with it. I think um, it'll give us more active discussion atmosphere. Thank you for doing that. Um, so if you have any questions for our speaker, Anupriya, please um, use the icon raise and button, which can be found if you go click reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you or Zoom doesn't uh, seem to have the button there, then please feel free to send me a message via Zoom chat, then I'll call on you when it's your turn. 
Now the floor is open for the questions. Yes, Brent, please go ahead. Thanks, Sung Wong. Thank you for that talk. As a biomechanist, um, I was nervous at first, but I actually, I understood what you were doing. So it was, it was a nice presentation. Thank you. I um, want to make sure I'm not missing something totally. So, you know, I understand how a rapid test of a glucose reading would be so important for a, a diabetic to get because if they have a bad, you know, it's low or whatever, it could mean that they pass out or something worse happens. Osteoarthritis is a disease that develops over decades. And so um, I'm just wondering why it's needed that we develop a sort of a rapid home test so somebody can kind of figure out what their serum comp levels are. Uh, so that's sort of my, you know, because you could just go to a clinic every six months or something. Um, so maybe you could just answer that question for me. Yeah, so uh, first thing is, uh, it's not a home-based test. It's like um, uh, we intend to have, like I said, uh, the biomarkers exist long before the radiographic joint space narrowing. So in order to have that, you know, included in the serum, like we go, normally we go for blood tests at the, you know, clinics. We could have, if we have any pain or something like that, you know, and then you could have it tested at early stages rather than going tested at 45. You could just get it tested at 25. Like suppose if you have any uh, symptoms or you have any concentration that would indicate that you might have uh, osteoarthritis in the latest stages of your life. So it was, uh, it was not home-based, sorry. Okay, but also then not something that, um, not necessarily something that everybody would have one of these, right, in their pocket and they could just do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this would be something that a clinician would have when you go yeah. maybe to see... Yeah. The, your primary care doctor exactly. and they would be like, okay, let me check your serum comp or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, so I, mean, I did something. Right. It's, uh, yeah, it's initially the comp uh, that I took, but uh, at later stage of the uh, research, I would go with other biomarkers uh, associated with the disease as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, Beno, please go ahead. So you know it with 30 that you have, you will have osteoarthritis. So what then, what does it help? I mean, what, it just makes your life miserable to think about your old age or, I, I don't see what the advantage is. Could you explain that to me? Uh, well, that's, thank you. That's really a nice question because yesterday, uh, uh, Dr. Herzog and I were discussing the same thing that what if, you know, we are able to detect it at early stages, then, then what, then what's the next step? Like what's the intervention? So I think uh, being on the diagnostic side, I would just say uh, I could provide a platform or, uh, you know, for the pharmacists or people doing research in the uh, treatment side to come up with something that could have an intervention where you could um, slow the progression or, uh, have it less painful <laughs> right now I could just say this much but, but do we do we have such no 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 currently we don't have uh, though uh, I think uh, professor Herzog's group works on um, uh, like doing interventions of how it would affect um, if a person, if or in animal models, generally we do where uh, you have different uh, uh, fibers, or uh, I think Professor Herzog, uh, could you please answer that? And I have a second question, maybe if I may. You Go ahead, Peno. mentioned you mentioned that uh, fifteen percent of the people over sixty have osteoarthritis. If will, I see, will have by twenty fifty. Pardon me. Uh, so it was by United Nations that they predicted, uh, looking at the statistics, that by twenty fifty, year twenty fifty, uh, fifteen percent of the uh, people aged uh, over sixty will have osteoarthritis. How many are there now in that uh, age group? 
You know, I think it's much more. Yeah. Um, Looking at my colleagues, left and right, I, I think it's a, rather something like 50%. So if, if in 1950, it's only 15%, that's an advantage. <laughs> I, I don't know where the numbers come from, but yeah. I, I doubt the 15%. So it was, uh, uh, the statement said, uh, it's 20% of the world's population will be A60, and out of that 20%, like 15% will have osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Brent, you have uh, other questions for Anupriya? I do have a question, but I'll just say, you know, Benno has firsthand experience with this OA yeah. stuff. So That's he, right. He, he, he's got the numbers. Um, okay, so the other thing I was thinking about logistics of going in to see the clinician uh, to get your um, serum comp taken is a lot of biomarkers have sort of a diurnal kind of fluctuation. And what would that do to your signal? I mean, maybe somebody has their clinical appointment at 6 a.m. and another person has their appointment at 5 p.m. And, you know, just because they're, you know, appointments within six months, if it's the same person, let's say, there's six month appointments were not at the same time. Is, is that going to be a problem? Do you know anything about the uh, circadian rhythm? of? So, I think there was an article like in 2017 that uh, they had this uh, daytime variation where they uh, took uh, during different day, uh, like the uh, same day, like different time frames and compared the serum comp and uh, they found like it did not vary much. It was uh, closely related, it did vary. It did, uh, you know, differ, but it didn't vary much, like significantly. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yes, Art, please go ahead. Well, th this is just a question out of curiosity. I don't know too much about how these biosensors work, but I was just wondering, when you have something like this, does it just work uh, as an absolute measurement, or do you need to do some sort of calibration? Like, do you need a you know, a test solution or two test solutions that you have to uh, try your sensor on. And then from that, you, you figure out the, you know, some coefficients or, or things like that. Um, normally, uh, I think it would depend on a batch fabrication, the way it's done, like uh, each of the batch, they come, they are calibrated because they might have some uh, inter-batch variations. So you have a standard uh, calibration curve for one batch and then uh, the, uh, the test uh, then uh, you know uh, depends on that. Great. Not for Thanks. every not for every uh, other test you have to do the uh, okay. calibration. I still um, yeah Tim please go ahead. Uh, Anapriya, I had a I had a question you you showed in that chart that from from you know, no OA to, to very severe OA. Uh, in the serum, I didn't see that there was any significant difference. So I'm wondering how your test is gonna be used. I mean, the chart that you pulled up, there was a P of 0 0.12, I think it was for that. Yeah, yeah, so. If you could maybe share your screen and go back to that. I just want to see if I saw that correctly. Okay, this one? Yes, that's the one. So yeah. I guess, so I have to close that there. So I can see, so so from mild to moderate and then to severe in the mm -hmm. serum comp, there doesn't seem to be any significant difference there. I mean, there isn't in the, in the synovial fluid, but, mm -hmm. but from my reading of that, if you were to take serum comp levels from the mild person and the severe OA person, there was actually no difference. So how are you? So how are you going to use your test? Are you going to to track individual comp levels in people to see if it rises over time? Because from the basis of this test, you know, being used on this population, I don't see that you would see anything significant. 
yes so um, like i showed this i included this uh, chart in order to uh, show kind of comparison like when we look at the maximum level of all these uh, subcategories like mild moderate and severe we see a trend like the decreasing trend uh, in the max level like for max it's uh, around uh, 2.5 nanogram per ml like uh, 2004 uh, 542 nanogram per ml and then it goes on decreasing so um, so i think um i think it's it's more likely uh tracking the individual patients over a certain period of time uh and then going from zero to development of the osteoarthritis i'm not sure how well it would be able to uh go to that level where it could uh, distinguish from from uh, mild moderate and severe which is of course like third grade three and grade four oa Right. Okay. Because I mean, the synovial fluid shows a very, you know, a marked increase with the severity of the disease. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But your but your test is going to be based on serum. You're going to be taking yeah. blood samples, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because a serum because it's uh, like easily accessible. Like people won't be uh, like control groups won't be able to give this uh, like synovial fluid as it is. You know, like we won't have the control samples then for synovial fluid. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. I still have a few more minutes for a more a couple more questions. Yes, Walter, did you actually raise your hands? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, I did. Yeah, and I have a couple of, couple of questions, and uh, some are similar to to uh, what has been asked before. But um, what what do you act? You know, um, you said that comp is released from um, from the chondrocytes, and what what do we know actually, if anything? when and how um, COMP is released? For example, you know, I just want to give an example. Uh, you know, several years ago when we had Tannen Schmidt in the lab, he was very interested in, um, in another protein, PRG4, for lubrication. And, uh, and then it could be shown very easily that PRG4 release could be triggered by loading of the joint so if you took an animal and we just loaded the joint a couple of times in a row, these PRG4 levels would increase, you know, like crazy. Is there something similar here uh, about the release of comp that you're aware of that's, you know, aside from the diurnal variation potentially, you know, um, is there potentially a mechanical, a mechanical component that might affect uh, the instantaneous levels of, of comp that you have or anything that's known about comp release. Why is comp released when we have OA? Do we know anything about that? Like what is triggering that? I'm not, I'm not really uh, sure of any mechanical uh, stimulations to that. I mean, even if it exists, I'm sorry, I don't um, really know anything of that. Um, but it's because of the cartilage degeneration. So like, how, how would it be affected if we have cartilage degeneration and then uh, the compass release in the cerebral fluid and then it goes to the uh, serum uh, via blood? So, so if you assume it's a cartilage degeneration and, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. not exactly sure what that means, uh, it seems in some animal models, the first thing we seem to see is that after ACL transection in a rabbit, for example, there's a, there's a change in the orientation of the collagen myofibrils, you know, would that already then be reflected in comp? Or a second, a second thing that seems to happen is that there is a loss of proteoglycan, uh, pr primarily from the superficial zone. Would then, then, would that then, for example, uh, trigger comp? Or, or, you know, I think it would be important to understand or, or at least see what's in the literature about what events people think with cartilage degeneration might be associated with comp release because you know there's a, there's a lot of things uh, because cartilage degeneration doesn't really mean a lot to me uh, but you know when you follow cartilage degeneration over osteoarthritis disease there seem to be various things that seem to be happening and of course some people would argue that uh, it has nothing to do with cartilage at the beginning. It's all starting in the bone. 
And then the question becomes, well, if it's in the bone, would that actually be visible in, um, in comp release? So I think, and the, the other, th so, I, so I think we need to think a bit about that. But the other thing is, you know, we have talked about other biomarkers. Yeah. Um, are there other biomarkers that uh, you have in mind at the moment? And, and what, you know, let's say you say comp is responsible for cartilage degradation. Um, do you know what these other biomarkers are and what they potentially might measure, what biological events they might measure? So uh, the other one is hyaluronic acid, which okay. I, yeah, which is uh, uh, which is which provides lubrication to the joints, mm -hmm. uh, and it is seen to um, uh, the molecular weight of that hyaluronic acid changes uh, when we compare uh, a normal a control group to an osteoarthritic group. So that uh, is a good biomarker to distinguish between OA and because in some cases in order to have the uh, relief in the pain and uh, inflammation. Uh, we have even hyaluronic acid uh, uh, injections as well. Yeah. The, the other thing that I had, you know, in the, just purely on the biosensor side, mm -hmm. uh, the calibration that you showed us was from zero to 100 nanograms per microliter. But yeah. as, then, as you showed, you know, it goes up to two and a half thousand or so. Yeah. So are you not worried about uh, beyond 100? Or, yeah, why, you know, why? Did you calibrate such a, a tiny, small uh, range of the potential range that you might be seeing? Yeah, so this was, uh, I have the calibration curve till uh, three microgram per ml uh, of the uh, uh, concentration. Uh, but this was uh, in order to see, because normally biosensors, they, re, uh, they have really good calibration uh, in higher ranges. Like, you know, when you don't uh, have like, suppose one picogram and then uh, one nanogram and then one microgram per ml. But I wanted to see how well it differentiates one concentration, like a small concentration, to the other concentrations. It would be really uh, like I have the calibration curve, but I did not import it because I, my target was to uh, show how well it differentiates even in these smaller ranges as well. Normally, the biosensors they don't they are not that linear in the small concentration range. Okay. Do yeah. you know when your sensor, the way you built it, uh, would be saturated? Yeah, it's uh, three microgram per ml. Like after that, I don't see uh, any uh, decrease in the peak that I- I'm Three micro, so 3,000 nanograms yeah. per microliter. So you, you would then cover the full range. Yeah, okay, exactly. that's good. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm aware of some comp studies that have looked at uh, uh, mechanical interventions of the joint, you know, an ACL transection and that like what I would call post-traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, now here with us, you're looking at an obesity induced um, model. Um, do you, is there any information out there on comp release and comp changes with a potential osteoarthritis onset in, in metabolic, in a mot metabolically induced OA? Well, I have one with ACL where uh, they show in the annual model, it's like really small. In human, we have such a big variation like going to thousands, but in animal model is around like one nanogram per ml to uh, over 12 weeks. It's just like 3.25 uh, nanogram per ml. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not that sure about the obesity model, uh, but of course it differs from the uh, post-traumatic model and the uh, in, like obesity model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to speculate a little bit, you must have been thinking about that as you developed the study with NADA, what do you expect to see in uh, terms of comp levels with the high fat sucrose diet, you know, at zero, three, six, nine, 12 weeks. What, what, what do you expect to see? I, I know you don't know that yet, but uh, do you have any, uh, you know, a framework in mind? Uh, uh, I mean, looking at the ACL model, the, uh, it showed for a rabbit and it, there, it was an increasing trend, but since this is obesity model and uh, um, as in humans we see, uh, it's uh, the trend decreases like at the onset it's really high concentration and then as the uh, disease progresses it's going to be like lower 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 in concentration so I'm expecting the same but let's see and okay. that's a surprise yeah okay good yeah. thanks yeah. I see Venus you have a question as well please go ahead uh, yes uh, so uh, I think I understood that you do, uh, you, you want to measure calm in the blood. Yeah. 
So, and you want to use it in a prognostic way, like to try to guess whether there will be, or whether we have, or somebody has a uh, OA or the likelihood of OA? I mean, I would start with diagnostic. <laughs> then based on that, if it's prognostic, like of course we aim at prognostic, how well it is able to, uh, uh, you know, track. So th that will be a long study in order to track, uh, you know, in order to have a, a, a predict the onset of osteoarthritis. Let's see. Because I'm, I'm wondering, like if I, I, I'm detecting calm in, in blood, so I need to have uh, pain in my knee, in a given knee or in a given joint. So, so, so that I would say, oh, there is calm. So there must be OA or it's the onset of OA because if it's in the blood, so I will not know if I don't have pain, if I don't have other ways to, to, to see where this is happening. So I will not know in which joint. So I was just thinking, like, I just proposed this to my supervisor. Like he said, he has the same question. Why would I even go to a physician? I said, well, you go for a routinely checkup, right? For your blood and all the uh, like entire body checkup. Why don't you do it then? Like, and then, you know, every year, you know, okay, fine. What's the, and you just include this one as calm, you know, for your bones, bone health. And why not just get one test more, like done more. Okay. Okay, and I'm, I'm thinking about a, a way to use it also for the efficacy of a treatment. Like if people, are, they, they have OA and they, they need to stop it, stop the degeneration of the joints. And so if calm is decreasing and decreasing in the blood, so this means that the treatment maybe is, uh, is working or at preventing the progression of OA. I know that there is no treatment for OA, but at least prevent the progression of the of the degradation of cartilage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, That's... thank you. Sorry, will there be any further questions for Anipriya? Um, Okay, I do. okay. see Walter, you have a question? Yeah, yeah I have an, an, another uh, kind of unrelated question, and uh, but I'm just curious uh, because in, in humans, we know that uh, osteoarthritis seems to be sex linked to a certain degree. Uh, women tend to have more, at least knee joint osteoarthritis. I'm not sure if that's true for other osteoarthritis as well, but they seem to have more knee joint osteoarthritis than men. Um, are you aware if um, COMP or other biomarkers would be distinctly uh, sex linked? They might be different. They might have to be treated differently uh, between men and women. Yeah, there was a study which uh, showed uh, uh, like gender based. And in that, the concentration of the COMP actually was higher uh, in the female as compared to the male. So um, it was, and then as the degrees, uh, you know, uh, as they uh, compared the uh, control group and the osteoarthritic group, they observed the same thing. Even in the normal uh, uh, male, it was higher as compared to the female. And even in the osteoarthritic group, like if the, both like the male and the female have osteoarthritis at the same stage, even then the concentration of the comp was higher in male compared to the female. And in that particular article, did they, speculate why the um, comp levels might have been higher in the men compared to the women? Um, not really. Uh, sorry, I said uh, it was higher in the female. It was and higher in the female, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So if yeah. it was higher in the female, same question. Did they, uh, did yeah. they uh, speculate why that would be? Yeah, uh, the reason was like uh, something related to the bone density and the mechanical load that the, uh, the bone structure basically of the uh, male and the female, it's kind of uh, the female body is not made for uh, uh, like that uh, load bearing. And uh, sometimes because of the all uh, uh, like uh, uh, the load bearing capacity of the joints, that's what uh, it said. Was different between males and females. Yeah, and females. yeah that's why females tend to have more uh, knee OA or OA as compared to the male. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That uh, surprises me a bit, but uh, but uh, I guess uh, I don't really have a, an answer already or, or evidence to for uh, for saying something else. Yeah, yeah, good. I could get back if I'm wrong. Like I might have. Uh, I just look at the. Uh... 
<clears throat> there be any last question for Anipriya? If not, I would like to thank Anipriya again for giving a talk. Um, for the next week's seminar, we will be hearing from an invited speaker, um, Dr. Jos van Ran Tergem at the um, Catholic University Leuven in Belgium. And he will talk about mechanotherapy, turning movement into medicine. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Francisca Pousset for inviting him. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you all next week.